Bay Area Discs 2015 Youth Ultimate Coaching Conference. My background is uh, I, I'm a Bay Area guy. I grew up in Palo Alto, uh, Palo Alto High School in San Jose State, so nearby here and through the various schools. I'm a high school history teacher uh, I, at Aragon and San Mateo nearby. And, uh, and I, I also coach football there and have done that for many years. Bless you. Um, my, my experience with the PCA is that I, I got involved in PCA back in 2000, so almost you know, 13, 14 years ago now. And, and I, I fell into it. I just wanted to be a better coach. And I've been coaching at that point probably 12, 13 years already, high school level. But I just was curious about ways that I might become better at what I was trying to do. And I, and I ended up kind of getting connected with this message. And uh, before you know it, I ended up at, at some training events and, and found myself on the speaker's end of it. Um, I'm not going to, I never go into a talk like this trying to be an expert. I feel like the best thing to do is to try to tap into the ex expertise in the room. So I'm just going to start off with uh, curiosity about how many years people have been coaching. And this is coaching anything, right? Whether it's coaching ultimate, whether it's coaching tennis or whatever sport you um, ever coached before, just looking at cumulative years that you've possibly been involved as a, as a coach. So how about between zero and five years coaching? You're, you're in the zero to five years realm, okay? That's almost everybody then. Um, between five and 10 years coaching then, okay? How about over 10 years coaching? Okay, so we have, again, still quite a few people. Now, just don't, let me check it for ultimate. Um, how many of you have been coaching ultimate in the last few years? I mean, you're, 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 that's what you're doing. You're coaching ultimate. Okay. All right. Checking. Uh, well, li recently in the last couple of years, for sure. Okay. How many are here as parents? You know, you're, you're curious about the trajectory of it as a parent. Okay. Maybe you could be doing both, right? I mean, that's possible, right? To dip in both. I, I'm, I'm a big advocate. I'll, I'll tell you, there's a, there's a, it's funny. I was talking to Val before this whole thing uh, came off, and I was talking about, well, gee, what, how, how do you want to shape this and what have you? And I was talking about a, a student athlete that, that is a, was a very good player for us as far as football is concerned, was a, a wide receiver um, type guy, so a thin, fast dude that can really run and catch. And, uh, and surprise, surprise, uh, he turned out to be a fantastic ultimate um, competitor. And so he was involved in ultimate, and on occasion he'd be traveling to one event or another, and, uh, oh, I've got to go out to Minnesota for the national this, that, and the other. And, I, and we're like, oh, wow, you're really sailing along in that, right? And, oh, yeah, okay, see you later. And uh, great mentality, great attitude. Turns out he ended up uh, getting a scholarship. Not, well, they don't really give scholarships, but he's, he's going to, um, to UC Davis. Yeah, Nick Tolfa, right? And, it, and so, yeah, Nick's going to, Nick's going to Davis, and... He is uh, on the club there, which is a big deal, and that gives them that that gives them sort of gives them a great player. But it also, you know, anytime you play sports at a college or immediately connect with the group, that's why people join fraternities. People want to be involved in a way to kind of get to know what's happening, and so we we're just so happy for Nick. And it's funny talking to Val that about that. So let me just quickly. Uh, get into some things about the PCA. We're, we're on Twitter. If you tweet, and you can kind of look at some things. If you signed in, you'll get our get in contact with us. So I, that that's something that we think will be valuable because in the next short period of time, I have to chat with you. Um, I don't think that's going to be what seals the deal. I think it'll be the reflection that you have and a chance to kind of interplay with some of the information. So PCA. Um, I want to. I if if you were whether you're going to as a coach for a group of ultimate players, as a parent of, of ultimate players, if, if, if the upcoming season were over and it was a fantastic season and you were talking to a fellow coach or you were talking to your child and you were uh, talking about things that you hoped came out of it, you know, then it was, that was a great season. And you know what? I feel that this happened. I feel that that happened. I'm excited because this happened. I want you to talk about what you hope would come out of a season, which was a great season, if you were either coaching or 
parent of a kid who just got through playing Ultimate, what are some of the things that you're hoping that'll come out of it from a growth perspective? So if you just pick a partner and chat about that for a second, that's what I want. We're trying to make this interactive. What would you hope will come out of a season where you coached and or had a kid that was playing Ultimate? Pair up, ready, go, go. <laughs> Yeah, introduce yourselves. Fantastic start. Here's the thing. Hopefully, the bit of buzz that you started with right now will work its way back to the group. So as you reflect about the session and you had a chance to think about where your values were, I was just overhearing plain fly on the wall. Um, some of the conversations. Do you mind sharing with me a couple of the things that came out of your talks? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm curious. What were you talking about just as I kind of broke in? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. But we were just uh, saying about um, uh, building confidence, um, not, gro not just uh, growth in um, or sense of belonging, which is something I, I agree mm -hmm. to, like that connection. Um, what, what, it, what, I, what I was thinking about when confidence, and not just like individual confidence, but like the realization that everyone plays a part and uh, you know, has something to contribute. So, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I just was jotting a couple ideas down while you were talking. Uh, what, about, what about up front? What, is there one or two things that you guys were buzzing on that you, that you want to, do you feel like sharing? Are you okay sharing that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mine was just that uh, the kids would say, oh my gosh, I think I made a new friend. Okay. <laughs> Friends, friendship. Um, and particularly if it's fr someone from the other team, that would be even mm -hmm. you know, a bonus if they were able to connect with someone on the other team. I, where the opponent brings out our best. So uh, if, that, if that is the case, uh, then with that in mind, why not somebody from the other team? Uh, because that way there's more joy in the whole, in the whole game. Um, Just to share, that's how we met. Wait, time, time out, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I'm coming over, I'm coming in. And you are husband, husband and wife. We have a kid who's starting to play ultimate now. And you met, wait, time, I gotta, wait, I gotta, I gotta, I have to pause to talk about this true love story. On Valentine's Day, no less, it couldn't know, right? get any kookier than that. What a moment, so you, so you met Playing ultimate. Playing, yeah, against we're on mixed teams. teams. Play, yeah, our teams are playing against each other. And next thing you know, and then, the sideline, yeah. up at the party. <laughs> and <laughs> the rest is history. One yeah. child later, one child later. One yeah, one child. <laughs> a few ultimate teams and child. Well, congratulations! I think yeah. that deserves oh, a round yeah. of applause. That that is a that's a cool story. Uh, uh, man, they don't write them any better than that. Uh, so, yeah. A lot can, apparently a lot can come. Real friendship. Real friendship. What, um, other, other thoughts? What, what were, you were buzzing over here. I think I overheard you say you had two kids, both of whom are playing, and you've been playing for a long time. What was, what was? Yeah, so I come into this from a different, couple different ways. And you, you brought up being a parent as opposed to being a coach. I've done coaching, I've done organization, and now I'm parenting players. And I was saying that I have, my kids are kind of different in ages. So like my son, who's 15, he's got a very different uh, what I want for him is more about what it has more to do with who he is and what he wants from the sport than what mm -hmm. I want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I'm I'm hoping is that he can start to what I hope for is that he can start to sort of achieve some of the things that he wants his expectations for, for the sport. And the, I'm looking for ways to support him in that. My daughter, who's eight and is just starting to play the game, I'm just hoping that she comes away from any experience loving the game the way that I do. And I can't force that to happen. I can, you know, I can, I can create opportunities for that, but that, that's as far as I can go. Okay, yeah. Other thoughts? I don't want to cut anybody off. <clears throat> Anything that uh, came up in that, up here? Just increased enthusiasm about the game. Like, you know, motivation comes with that enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm, okay. This is, I, this is about growing a movement, okay? And so PCA is a, is a, it's a, it's a dynamic organization, and we did a bunch of research and found that there's a tremendous amount of power behind uh, coaching. Tom was talking about how 
coaches are integral to introducing athletes. That's the way kids learn games. Um, we, we agree. Um, and what we find is that there's a lot of people who are involved in, in, in athletics who, who really want to help to show the skills and teach the skills and grow a sport, but may not really have a lot of background about uh, how to communicate with young people and, and, and how to create a model that, that would work best to, to be able to keep parents aligned with what is reasonable. Uh, and so this is about a partnership between all, all of the elements that really come into play when you think about um, kids and their youth sports experience. It, it, it's about coaches, it's certainly about parents, and it's also about players. So that we have a perfect mix in this room to kind of talk about some of those values. We have a couple clips connected in here, so I'm going to play one of those, and I'm going to you know, abbreviate through this slideshow. But this clip is uh, it's, uh, it's a little piece from Steve Young, who's one of our National Advisory Board members, talking about the power of, of coaches. Here we go. Your athletic career is most impacted, I think, by the first couple of coaches that you see in your youth sports. That's how you start to model in your mind how you deal with adversity, how you deal with team, how I fit within the team, all those concepts. And so I think my, my coaches, the most influential coaches, are my first couple, who are parent volunteers. Okay, so just uh, the highest paid coach at the professional level may very likely has less impact in the long run than the first couple of coaches because as you start to shape and figure out, like you were just saying about your eight-year-old daughter and when your son is 15, on the, on the trajectory, as I listen to Tom talk about the sort of developmental phases, we think it's very important to kind of get it right at whatever point you are communicating um, with kids. And so to that end, um, we have a model. That we partner with a lot of organizations and we have a lot of people helping us out who are famous in the sports entertainment world. But what we like to do is talk about our model. Okay, we have a foundational model that we call the double goal coach method, right? Um, this is a great book that if you can get access to it, maybe you can grab. Um, it, it's called The Power of Double Goal Coaching. It's written by Jim Thompson, who's our, our executive director. Um, and, and, it, and it features all the elements that I'm going to talk about um, here today. You can also, if you signed in, you'll, you'll start getting from our electronic. Um, we have a newsletter, and I'll, I'll share with you another website that I think you should um, lock onto your phone, because I think it could give you a bunch of tools, and you can reflect. But our model is basically this, and we, we, when, when we started figuring out what we wanted to do, we said, look, winning is important. And we said, let's put together a competitive model. So we'll say winning is, winning is number one, okay? But then we started talking about um, a second goal model. And we said, you know what, be a second goal coach, be a second goal parent, understand what the second goal is. And you all were talking about confidence team building, a sense of belonging, new friends, opponents, goal setting and achievement, love of the game, enthusiasm about the game. All those things come from the teaching life lessons side. Parents can get behind those kinds of messages. Coach, coaches can get behind those kinds of messages. Kids can get behind those kinds of messages. So what we found is that we wanted to activate our model um, through some principles, right? We, we feel that, first of all, these are not exclusive, but they're, they're overlapped in a VIN. And we are expressly an organization that articulates this idea of an anti-win-at-all-cost mentality. When I, the the win-at-all-cost mentality is driving kids out of sports at a rate of 70% by the time they're 13 years old. Now, those of us that are that are, that are playing, continue to play ultimate now, and continue to be in shape and, and you know, stay healthy, realize the virtues and the benefits of continuing to be active, an active lifestyle. Also, the idea that competition forges in you an opportunity to develop all these different character traits that will serve you later in life. The vast majority of people that play sports are not going to get scholarships. So, you know, we get down to why you're playing and, and what benefits come, right? So we say, coach from or parent from or participate from the second goal side. And, and, and kind of here's why. For us, we focus on three basic principles. And we talk about this from a parental perspective, from the athlete perspective. If I were talking to you from the athletic perspective, because a lot of you still play ultimate, I would say, look, it's about making yourself better. 
and understanding how to do that through what we call the mastery approach, I'd say it's about making your teammates better by being the kind of teammate that understands how to fill emotional tanks. And I would say it's about bringing honor to the game so that the people that you're around understand as you try to grow this great game that there's a reason why so many people are compelled to continue to play it and why there's a growth model going on and why it may become an Olympic sport sooner than later. If I were talking to you as a, as a parent, I would say, similarly, understand the type of effort specifically that's going into what it is your child is doing as they're learning the game. They're not just out there flinging a disc around. Understand what they're trying to learn and that mistakes, it's a fast paced game and, and, and so understand that mistakes have gotta be okay in the process. Um, again, as a parent, your only job is unconditional love. When it comes to the idea of sport, the idea is unconditional love and work on being sure that your kids know that you're there for support. The heck with the getting in the back of the car, driving home from, the, from whatever kind of competition it is, where the parent starts to pick apart um, the athlete for their performance, right? Though, um, I don't imagine it happens as much with the culture of ultimate, but just concerned that people understand it. And then the concept of honoring the game. Come on in. Um, is the idea of, of competing with honor and ultimately with, with the concept of respect. Um, we have this model kind of broken down and it, it's kind of, it's, we have a clip built in here which is the exact opposite of our mentality. It happens to be a football example of a post-game talk by a coach. But I just don't get the fact, I don't get the sense that the, the ultimate coach mindset fits this model. Um, but I'm gonna show it anyway because it is one of those, it's one of those clips that will give you perspective about the win at all cost mentality. If you said, well, gee, we want this to become an Olympic sport. And as Tom was saying earlier, boy, that, those, those Olympic coaches are, are, and people at the AOC are very concerned with winning and they really want people to win. Did you hear about the winning part? And he said that a lot in spite of the fact that he was talking about all these other things that he feels are important in the developmental timeline of an athlete. He, when he started talking about the super competitive model part, he, he was really excited about that part, and, and rightfully so. Uh, when it gets to that part, are people motivated to win and to do so the right way? Or are they doing it in a way that, that, that kills the joy? This is sort of about killing the joy. It's the old school model. So I'm gonna play it, and we're gonna move on to some other thoughts before uh, you guys uh, get to the rest of your day. I have a bunch of other things to share, but this one's kind of interesting. Give good effort out there today. Let me be clear about this. A good effort yeah, is not enough. And I'm proud of it. But I will not accept losing with you. Because there's only one thing they judge us on. There's only one thing people remember. And it ain't how we play the game. Winning is everything. So this is the win at all cost model. This is the, you know, you lost the game and it's your fault. Not accepting shared accountability, but, but the, the blame placing post game talk. And it's the, it's the exact opposite of of our model. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set up uh, our, our, this question for you actually. This is a good one. And then, because Tom is talking about the Olympics. So, the question is, which Olympic athletes earn the most medals? Those that focus on the scoreboard and winning, or those that focus on mastering their sport and getting better. That's, that's the question I'm hanging out there. So I'm gonna pull you on this one. Hands up for number one, you focus on winning and that's why you win. Hands up for number two, you focus on getting better and that's why you find yourself on the winning, yeah. So if we all know that, what, what is it about the coach who doesn't understand that or what is it about the mentality of the person that says, well we better do this year round instead of being multi-sport athletes Let's do this year round uh, because that way we'll continue to get better. Forget about those, uh, those overuse injuries. Forget about having uh, surgery for something that you shouldn't really ever 
have break down. Uh, so what we talk about is the idea of how do you make better athletes better people? That's, that's what we're about, right? So for this principle, it's about a mastery definition. It's about effort, and it's about understanding what effort looks like in, in this sport, right? And it's a new sport, so there's a lot of energy behind it. Not new, but new enough where the, the energy behind it is, is just going to start to gather, right? So as this education campaign comes out that Tom was talking about, what does effort look like for ultimate? What, what, is, what is it to learn the game and, and to enjoy it? And then, again, the whole thing, bounce, the, the bouncing back from mistakes piece is really big because there'll be a lot of mistakes made while people learn how to play the game and learn to play the game at a competitive level. So how do you do that? Now, we know the scoreboard definition. As the game starts to become more competitive and people begin to get more aware of what it is and it grows a little bit, are they going to be able to stay true? Are we, as supporters of the game, as participants in the game, going to be able to stay true to the model that's been described? Or are we going to let the pressure of, um, of whatever it is, TV money, leagues and associations, or whatever it may be, warp our model and our perspective on what it is we're trying to do? What I see right now when I, sit in on the, on, when I sat in there with Tom and when I talked to Val leading up to this is that there's a lot of virtuous tendencies behind Ultimate that can be realized through people doing this the right way. I think the reason why I'm here is to kind of talk about, well, gee, we have a systems approach. And we say, coaches, coach this way, because we know that it unlocks potential and it helps you to rise to your level of, of your capabilities. And there's research behind why. So if I'm just thinking about you know, playing great defense, right? I'm thinking about playing in the open field, I'm moving without the, without the disc, getting open, Whatever I'm doing and my fundamental skills that are related to the sport, or as a coach, if I'm thinking about looking for mastery of certain skills, or as, an, as, a, as a parent, if I'm just supporting, I realize that as, as my kids play, or in all levels, from all those perspectives, anxiety goes down if I'm just thinking about getting better. I'm just thinking about getting better, and I'm just thinking about applying what it feels like to get better to my experience as a player, as a coach, as a parent. I want to support that because as you guys said, this idea of confidence, it's that, it's that fleeting thing that we all need when we're getting ready to go to a meeting, that we all need when we're getting ready to, to plan our next move. Confidence goes up, anxiety goes down. And we're trying to teach some of those intangibles and sport is the best place to make that happen. So we say teach through that, the Elm Tree approach because we know it works and it unlocks kids' true potential. This research was done with nine-year-olds, right, and, and applied with elementary age kids. And it holds true as people grow older, and the challenge for competition increases. If anything, the spotlight is brighter, and the failure is bigger. So when they apply this concept with uh, people competing at the college level, what did they find? They found that the mastery approach is the best way to unlock potential and to keep moving towards the most important play in any sport. Hey, by the way, what is the most important play in any sport? Whether it's ultimate or, or baseball or football or basketball, what is the most important play? It is. It's the next one. It's the next one. And, and so if we get tied up with making a mistake or get lost, it's going to be a problem. We want players to have a feeling of control and or confidence, right? And for us, in order to make that happen, we emphasize a concept. I'm not going to have you go through the scenario because I want to make sure you get the core of the talk. But if you had uh, your child or a player that you coach get into, I call a doom loop, get super upset with themselves when they don't complete the, you know, they didn't catch the disc and so the turnover or they didn't make a good throw. And there are these type of people that just, have an emotional deal when things don't go right. Um, we, ought, we, we talk about as a parent. We talk about as a player. We talk about as a coach. How do you get, how do you get, well, you know, let's do this, because we have time. We've got 20 minutes. Let's do this. I think it's really important. How do you get, and this will be a breakout. You take, take two minutes and talk about it. How do you get your son or daughter the player that's playing for you, or yourself for that matter, past 
the doom loop, you know, past the point where you're going to get frozen and get upset to the point where you can't continue. How do you stop yourself from making that happen? Take a couple minutes to talk about it, and I'll come right back to you. Go, 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 go. I let off last time, so I'll be Okay, wait, but this is a, this is a, this is a tough one for me in some ways because I think my son struggles with this. When I think about it for myself, for older kids, or, you know, no, I know that there's a lot of kids. Right, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's I'm hearing some incredibly rich conversations. I want to make sure that everybody has a chance. I'm going to, I'm going to ask people to share a little bit. I'm really glad we decided to take that time it, because if we've only got 15 minutes left and we can clarify some of what we just heard from each other, I think that'll be a big growth moment. I have a couple other principles I want to kind of get to, but I want to say it, I'm very impressed by some of the things I'm hearing. So there's some references to body language, and there's some references to, well, a lot of things. So I'm not going to steal anyone's thunder. Uh, somebody want to share what they were talking about so that everybody else can benefit? What, what's some of the, some of what was happening? One thing one yeah. that Jonathan said that I, I really appreciated was uh, refocusing students out of a, a totally individual mindset into a, into a team mindset. So in this situation, not... Not what did I do, but but you know what does my team need me uh, to do in this moment, um, and that's something you can do in a, in a momentary sideline coaching situation, but also you know season long in terms of the way we talk about what we're doing here. I love it. I love it. Just change the focus from. Okay, so beautiful. What about over here? What's going on? I saw, or both Shauna and uh, and Jude mentioned uh, the body language. It's sort of how do you respond to a mistake? And if you model as a coach that this isn't the response that you want to have this response because, um, as you pointed out, you're now interacting with and, and your teammates and you're having to look them in the eye and talk about what, what happened. I mean, that, if you can create that culture, then it becomes a habit. And then you get support from it, yeah, and it, it starts, okay. it immediately moves to a positive direction. Yeah. It takes on its own momentum, doesn't it? Uh, I just was impressed by that. I overheard some things over here. Just the idea of setting a culture, as Sean was saying, where that becomes the expectation that you transition away from whatever the mistake is and have the, and have the capacity to bounce back. I use, we use those terms, bounce back. That's why we say mistakes are OK because of that. What do you have, Amy? One thing that I I'm sensitive to is that idea. I feel like as a as a player for years, it's often been, oh, you made a mistake, go get it back. Like go, like go, you know, like there you threw something away. Like go play D so that you can get it back. It kind of it's motivating in a sense because you're like, oh, I'm still responsible to my team. I need to go. I need to go do something. Right. But I feel like also there's an aspect of that that you kind of have to make up for your mistake. Right. And I wonder mm -hmm. if you have any guidance or if anybody has mm -hmm. ideas too. How do you just make the I mistake think that be okay? On the Honestly, yeah. some players cool. respond well to that, others don't, in yeah. my, in my yeah. experience. Yeah. But if we can, if we can teach it. the kids but that it's just okay to make a What's mistake, that? and then you right. just go and yeah. play normal. Yeah. You can share that, though. Right. You can use examples yeah. of that. I use example of um, this, it was the, the finals in the regional tournament where the team was either going to go to nationals or not, and they hadn't been in nationals in a long time. And I think it might have been the captain of the team is receiving the disc, and he drops it on like the two yard line. So that's the natural thing is, oh, I can't believe I did that, you know? And this is, the, it, oh, sorry, it was Universe Point, All right? So Universe Point, he's catching the disc, he drops it on the two yard line. And what happens, they play the point, they get it back, and they go all the way down the field and score and, and win the game and go to nationals. But, you know, that, again, it was, okay, made the mistake, What's next? You know, but it was a real example. This really happened, and it was you know local, somebody you know, you know something like that. It's it could be you. That's you. Right. Um, and to answer your question, I agree. And these are these are this is a fragile situation because being human, nobody's out there trying to make mistakes. We're out there trying to make the play, and mistakes happen. So it happen, It does happen to be a relationship between the coach, the players, the players amongst themselves. Um, what's the concept, what's the virtue, what's the value, what do you do? And I, and well, um, 
Yeah, but go ahead. Chunk of it is the culture you created the team before that. Perhaps right. Right. It's, it's yeah, the yeah, team that's, that's, that picks you up, not the coach necessarily at that right. point. Right. And it's how you frame it as, as opposed to having to make it up as seeing it as more of like the culture being like you're creating an opportunity to, you know, the whole team. For that to help the team, you know, every 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 play is an opportunity to help. That's a great story. And, and he was talking about the sidelines. That you know, yeah. you're right. It's not the it's not the coach, but mm -hmm. if you see the whole sideline saying "get it back" and you can do it, and we're still going to get this point, that's so different than just having the coach, you know, say. One thing that we we what I always try to do with my when I coach it is my kids. We have like a. It's not even necessarily get it back. But the focus is turns it into the next play, so we have a chant, GTB back on D, mm -hmm. right? And that's everybody yells it, you turn it over, everybody yells it, because now that you're on your neck, you're focusing on the next part of the game, which mm -hmm. is playing D, mm -hmm. yeah. as opposed to what yeah, happened exactly. previously, right. which is like, oh, you can't make that choice. Oh. When I I, don't, I hate hearing that, I hate hearing. Kids oh, shoot! Sure. I, mm -hmm. I, you guys are right in my wheelhouse right now, so I'm going to yeah. share something with you. <laughs> Um, so the, these are two pretty well-known sports psychologists that contributed to the body of our work, and we're saying, okay, what, what, what does negativity do, right? It robs you of the moment. It robs you of the most important thing that you're doing as a competitor with a group of other people, and that's getting ready for what's going to happen next, right? So we talk about a mistake ritual, uh, and a lot of people talk about the concept of a mistake ritual. The one we often talk about is the flush. You know, or brush it off, or I can I can shake it, shake it off, whatever. But I can I can get rid of that mistake while I'm transitioning, and I and my teammates on the sideline can have a physical body language sign that lets me know that it's cool. Um, we can talk about the power of body language and make sure that when a mistake happens, that as players and as coaches, we do not um, succumb to the I'm crushed mentality because if we do that, that that takes us away from what's important, right? So um, what positivity does is it opens it up, opens us up to positive, um, possibilities. Um, we talk about the blending of youth sports being kind of a development zone concept where a capable, helpful, thoughtful coach sets a culture based upon her or his philosophy and embodies that in practice and in games so that kids or participants, excuse me, at whatever age, have a chance to grow. Um, I have a quick clip where Jim Thompson, our executive director, describes the development zone in contrast to the win at all cost entertainment sports culture. And this is where we hang our hat. Um, this is where our principles come together. Um, if I take you back to that slide where I said, okay, effort, learning, mistakes, okay. The other piece is filling emotional tanks. And so it's being relentlessly positive. We found that the tipping point, just to show this before I show Jim's clip, we found the tipping point of relentless positivity was five to one. So for every point of correction that I wish to make with you, if I were gonna make a correction, I have to be five positive things that I've caught you doing right or that we see that you're doing well. Now, if the culture of your mentality is in your practice among the athletes, in terms of how they communicate with each other and their body language and their disposition is such that you can get there, then what's gonna happen is as you give instruction you're going to have an opportunity to get kids to realize what it is to be a better athlete and a better person. Because it's just an expectation that there's not going to be um, kids criticizing each other when they, when they do something wrong. They're going to wait for the moment where the person does something right and pick them up. Now, if it's a mistake during a game, that's when we pat each other on the back. We keep our body language going. And the other principle is about the idea of adding honor to our competition so that we as an individual, our club, our particular sports community that we're representing, and the game for, for that matter, because this game is really hinges deeply upon the spirit of the game and, and kind of a sense of a positivity already, that, that you live by that, that code of ethics. It's so important. Now, we contrast the idea of the entertainment sports culture where the experience of the fan, Jim doesn't say this, but this is what I say. Look. If the experience of the fan matters more than the experience of the participant, that's entertainment sports. If the experience of the participant matters, you know, it, it, ultimate is a sport that is very entertaining, but also has a very rich experience for the participant. 
and it's enriching in that regard. So that's where I think the sales point is. Here's Jim talking about why the development zone is so important, where a lot of the things that you've been sharing in here in the last little bit can come together. School and youth sports as a development zone where the goal is developing better athletes, better people. Now, as you might guess, there's quite a difference between the uh, entertainment, sports culture, and the development zone culture. For example, a bad official's call that goes against your team. In the entertainment sports culture, that is a travesty deserving of rebuke. In a development zone, a bad official's call is an opportunity for kids to work on resilience. Every successful adult has resilience. A losing streak. In the entertainment sports culture, that is awful. To the point where the fans even boo the home team if they lose too many games in a row. In the development zone, a losing streak is an opportunity for kids to learn to struggle. Now, a lot of people think struggle is a bad thing. Struggle is a good thing. And there's no better place for kids to learn to struggle, to persevere and persist and prevail when things don't go well, than high school and youth sports. And then there's the scoreboard. In the entertainment sports culture, the scoreboard, winning is either everything or the only thing. John Madden once said, winning is the best deodorant. He meant that if you win, you can get away with a lot of things that don't pass the smell test. Now it's not that the scoreboard's not important in the development zone. It's a crucial ingredient in the recipe for developing better athletes, better people. So I know that this sport self-officiates, so that's great, and it brings honor to the whole idea of competing together. Uh, the idea of the development zone concept is, well, hey, here's a coach who has expressed their philosophy. Ours is effort, learning, mistakes, okay, bounce back from mistakes. Ours is fill the emotional tanks of, of the people around you and for the reason of getting ready for the next play. Ours is ultimately be respectful of the rules, of the opponents, of the officials, since you self-officiate, of your teammates, and ultimately of yourself. That you set a standard where you hold yourself on a higher plane and you conduct yourself in a way that is ultimately desirable. That's our philosophy. We feel that parents can get behind that because it's tangible. You can have conversations with kids about those things, your children or players or each other. We, we think it's a message that people can get behind. So ultimately, the athletes at the top of the, of the pyramid and at the base of the pyramid are the coaches. There's the coach, there's the parents, there's the loved ones in the middle, and at the top is the athlete. It shouldn't be the expectation of the adult driving the athlete down. It should be the expectations of the adults picking the athlete up. So in a positive youth sports culture, that's what you have the opportunity to create. With the way this sport is sort of set and what is trending, it just seems to me like a natural fit the partnership that Val is with Barrier Disc, but also just generally with the way the sport is trending, that I can see PCA kind of growing in our connection with the way the sport is operating. Some of the tenants that are there seem like there's just a natural relationship that will probably grow. Look, I, I happen to know that the model that I'm talking about has been able to get coaches at the entertainment sports level a lot of wins. The people that are associated with us uh, who are dropping a lot of time and money into our organization, which is a nonprofit, have been very successful coaching in the new model. And it just so happens that the model that we have been promoting is one which is similar to theirs. And, and what they have done is come on board and helped us to systematize the message. I'm only out here talking about it because I know it works for the highest level of competition. I know it works for the youngest level. It gives people a common language to talk about to embrace this journey. And that way we can all get the best out of what sport has to offer. We can make people better. We can make better athletes. We can keep people moving towards being a contributor in the long run to a society 
by learning together and being together and growing towards, uh, towards shared and common goals. So I, I, have, I have to say, I'm impressed with uh, the feedback from the group. We don't have a very long time to be together, but just from the enriching conversations that you were having, I, I see a lot, of, uh, a lot of fortunate things coming your way. So I want to thank you for your time.